And now for today's program. Letty Cotton Pogobin is a writer and social justice activist. She is a founding editor of Ms. Magazine and has served as a Moment columnist for more than 30 years. Her articles and op-eds have appeared in dozens of periodicals, including the New York Times, Washington Post, and The Nation. Letty is the author of 12 books, including Deborah, Golda, and Me, Being Female and Jewish in America. Her just-released book is Shonda, A Memoir of Shame and Secrecy. Abigail Pogerbin is the author of Stars of David, Prominent Jews Talk About Being Jewish, and My Jewish Year, 18 Holidays, One Wandering Jew, which was a finalist for a National Jewish Book Award. She has written for The Atlantic, New York Magazine, and other publications, and wrote a series for The Forward called Still Small Voice, interviewing 18 clergy and scholars about their own faith, which received recognition from the Religious News Association and the American Je Jewish Press Association in 2021. A former Emmy-nominated producer for 60 Minutes, Abigail is co-host for JBS's In the Spotlight and moderates public interviews for the Manhattan JCC, Stryker Center, Shalom Hartman Institute, and AJC. Please welcome Letty Cotton Pogobin and Abigail Pogobin. Thank you, Suzanne. It's so good to be here. Hello, Mama. <laughs> Hello, daughter. <laughs> that's that's the end of the kindness. That's the end of the sweetness. Now we get to, now we get to the grilling. It's great to be with you. <laughs> you too. Um, so I have to admit that I had read this book four times, but I had not read it in its final form till the last three, four days. And it's, it is extraordinary. I don't say this just as someone you gave birth to. Um, it's a wholly different experience reading it now. It's beautiful. It's economical and, and heartrending at times and very funny. And so I just have to congratulate you before I start uh, interrogating you. Um, it, it, it ended up in an amazing place. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. So I want to start with the idea that secrets are Jewish. Uh, you write you, that you grew up believing secrets were intrinsically Jewish. I think there's probably a lot of people on this Zoom that feel the same way, but what made you feel that way? How do you, how do you link those two? Um, well, when I really sort of dug down deep, as they say nowadays, I, I realized I grew up with this. I grew up with secrets, uh, both in synagogue and in my home. In synagogue, I was listening to the Torah reading, and in the Torah reading, there are endless secrets and hiddenness. God hides, hides God's face, and Leah is hidden behind a veil, uh, and Jacob marries her when he really thought he was marrying Rachel. And there's um, a wonderful midrash about David, how he hides in a cave, and God makes a, a spider web form in the mouth of the cave. So the people who are searching for him say, oh, he couldn't be in there because there's a spider web it wouldn't have formed in time. And you and you list that Moses was hidden in the basket. Yeah, Moses and, was hidden, right? And that when he kills the Egyptian and hides the body, in, he hides the body in the sand. And of course, there's Esther's Jewishness, which he hides. He so hides. And Esther's name is is uh, uh, it means hidden. So I was imbibing all of that on top of the fact that I'm sitting at my family's dinner tables and every now and then someone would say, Sha, Sha, it's a Shanda. So to stop somebody else from telling a story that was uh, going to bring embarrassment to the family. And then how did, when you say the Sha, Sha, what did you grow up with knowing was not to be spoken? Uh, what did you, what were sort of the untouchables, would you say? Well, in our family, and I had, um, my parents were each one of seven, and then there were spouses of most of those seven, and then I was one of 24 cousins, so there were a lot of people and a lot of secrets. I knew, for example, that we were not supposed to talk about our transgressions of Judaism. I knew that my father, who was a Talmud scholar, uh, he was a lawyer by profession, but he had taught Hebrew school and he was a Talmud scholar and a Baal Kore. He could read the Torah lane beautifully. Um, I, and he presented himself in the world as a, you know, as a, as a totally observant Jew. But um, we went, we ate out every Sunday night. <laughs> we ate at Lundy's, which was seafood, and we ate at Topsy's, which was you know, Southern fried chicken with mac and cheese. And and we ate out, at, you know, at Chinese restaurants. So I couldn't tell, admit that because 
we had very religious people in my family and my father was always supposed to be the expert on everything. And suddenly he would be a transgressor. So I knew to keep that quiet. I knew that I wasn't supposed to tell anyone that my aunt Joan was barren. Of course, it turned out that she wasn't. And that was her secret. Can you tell us a little bit about that story? Yeah, uh, my my uncle Herbie married Aunt Joan after the Second World War brought him her into our family, which was a hysterically pronatalist family because it was post Holocaust and it was very important to replenish our people. So my Aunt Joan admitted to me in 1968 when your brother David was born, and. You know, David was in the corner in a little sleeping box and Joan had been raving about him. And when we sat down together with chocolate covered mugs of the two of us on your Aunt Betty's couch, she suddenly started talking to me about how wonderful David was and what a great little baby and how it must be hard for the twins, you and your sister Robin, with this new baby in that family. And I am trying to talk about the chocolate and the matzah. Barton's is making really good chocolate these days, you know, wasn't the meal delicious. And that's because everyone was always on Spilkus about the fact that she couldn't have a baby. She couldn't have a baby. She she had told the, the family she was barren. And, um, you know, we all felt sorry for her. We felt pity for her. So we were protecting her from our children from the child's noise, from how cute the child was, and from conversation about children. And here we are sitting on this couch, and she suddenly says, Letty, you do not have to keep mom about your little boy, your little bit, your new little baby. I, I've had four abortions, or three abortions, whatever it was. She said, I could not have admitted in your family, in my husband's family, which was my uncle, I could not have admitted I didn't want children. Women, Jewish women weren't allowed to not want children. And Herbie and I didn't. We, we agreed on that before we were married, but we knew we couldn't tell your family. So I came up with the best excuse to stop them from hocking me a china. I said I was barren and then everybody left me alone and felt sorry for me. So you talk about just the, the idea that there was sort of a, a pressure and an expectation that we were sort of supposed to replenish. Uh, there's also this sense that runs through your book of having the power of having a good name. And, and maybe that's part of that's linked to our survival. Um, this sense of kind of recreating ourselves in America. Uh, can you talk about just the, the pressure of reputation, mm -hmm. which, is so, which is so linked to Shonda, right? I mean, it isn't to Shonda if the stakes aren't high. Right, exactly. Yeah, and I have to agree with you that hiddenness and secrecy contributed to our survival. For millennia, millennia. Mm. Think of it. I mean, in the Inquisition, we were practicing Judaism in secret. In the Holocaust, we were hiding behind cabinets or false names or false passports. So it's not that hiddenness is a terrible thing to be when it is it contributes to, to your survival. But when you're hiding things you're ashamed of, when you're not able to own your own identity or to stand proudly in the world because you feel you're inferior or you want to hide your accent. Or in my mother's case, she so achingly felt ashamed of her poverty when she was growing up. Um, then, then it suddenly attacks you as a, as a living, breathing person in the world and you have to become something else. You have to become something presentable, especially because of Jewish exceptionalism. I mean, we were raised with a sense that we are a light unto the nations, that we are smart, we have Nobel Prize winners and all of that. And if you can't measure up, plus if there's a Shonda for the Goyim in front of the Gentiles, you have to change something in your life. And so you do, you pretend to be someone else, you take on a a disguise of some sort, you get rid of your accent, you reframe your entire past, which is what my parents did. And can we kind of drill down a little bit on your mom's attempts to do that, which were kind of Herculean. I mean, there's there's so much that went into the story she wrote for herself or rewrote for herself. Um, if you could start with some of the 
the kind of poverty history, which was shocking to me to revisit. And then that went into kind of the biggest lie of all, which you yes. discovered only, only as a young person. Yeah, when I was 12. Well, I didn't find out all about all my mother's lies, deceptions, charades. And I'm using harsh language because on paper, if you don't know her and you don't understand the why, it's like she was a big liar. And in her deathbed letter to my sister, Betty, who's 14 years older than I and therefore had many more years with her, my mother admits I lied because the truth was too hard to bear. Mm -hmm. So what did she do? Well, the first thing that I found out about is that she uh, graduated from the eighth grade and was deathly afraid people would find out she was uneducated. Um, certainly when my parents had me, uh, I, I mean, my father was a, a lawyer. He, he had so many years of education on her and she felt inadequate. But as a child, what she did was she went to a photo studio. She paid a, a photographer. She re reached into the prop box and took out a diploma, a shawl, flowers, you know, fake flowers. And she set up a high school portrait for herself. Mm -hmm. And so she would have a picture to put on on a bookcase that would suggest, she wouldn't lie outright, but would suggest to anybody that, that she was a high school graduate. And she carried that with her and it was on the wall in our house. Um, what my mother did beyond that was unimaginable to me. She worked in a garment, uh, in the garment center in a factory in a sewing uh, as a sewing machine operator. She worked probably a 10 or 12 hour day. But at a point when she did was, after she was divorced, secretly, no one, I never knew it, in 1923, she was, uh, 1927, she was single for 10 years. And during that period, she was dating. And she decided not to let her dates pick her up at the tenement where she lived with her mother and father and the seven children, nine people in three rooms. And if you've been to the tenement museum, that's a cleaned up version, version of where my, my mother grew up. So she engineered this entire plot that required her to leave her job, get in the subway, go up to an uncle's house in the upper Bronx, because this uncle had a decent apartment. And she would stay, uh, be there when her date picked her up. She gave the date that address. She asked my uncle, her uncle to act as her father. And she faked this entire life so that she could be picked up by someone without being ashamed of her environment. Finally, and then she would get back in the subway after the date left. She would wait a half an hour, get back in the subway, go all the way down to the Lower East Side to go home to sleep, two in a bed with my Aunt Tilly, her, her sister. The third story, that one that really kind of just broke my heart when my sister pointed out to me in a picture that I had seen but never really looked at, it's a picture of my Uncle Lou's wedding. And you know, there's always a lineup by the dais. And my sister, um, as I said, who knew things I didn't, says, look at the picture. Look at dad standing next to mom. He's the only one standing facing front. All the other uncles are kind of, you know, on an angle with their wives. Dad is front, mom is behind him on an angle. My mother had taken this photograph of herself and her first husband in a picture of her brother's wedding, brought it to the photo studio, which you can think of like Photoshop today, and asked them to cut out the first husband and paste in a picture of my father. So it would never be known when they moved from the Bronx to Jamaica and started a whole new life. She could put that picture up and it would never be known that she had a first husband. Mm -hmm. She pasted my father in. I thought, what? first of all, she bankrupted herself. To, she had to, took her like a year to pay the photo studio bill for that. But it mattered so much to her not to let that divorce ever be known. It was- And when, and when you learned it so late, how destabilizing was that? To learn that Betty, my Aunt Betty, was not your full sister, 14 years older, and that there was another sister uh, yeah. Rena, how, how, I mean, without telling all of it, because people should read it, it's, it's kind of an incredible, it's hard to believe it's true. Yeah. Just how much did that sort of rock the world? 
Well, imagine I was 12 years old. Um, I discovered at a, at a wedding because of a, a cousin who was angry that I had beat her at cards, um, upset the whole table, threw the cards at me and yelled at me, you think you're so great. You weren't even in, your family wasn't even in this family. Your mother came later. Your sister isn't even your whole sister. And at the end of her whole gishrai, I fainted dead away because I couldn't take in all that information. I thought of myself as I'm in a perfect family. I have this these parents and I have this sister. And she's much older than I am, but my mother always used to tell me, you know, that we tried hard. We couldn't conceive. It took us till, and now we were blessed with you, you know. So here I'm this beloved child of this loving family that my parents presented as a perfect Jewish American family. And I discover it's all a sham mm -hmm. that they're hiding, that both of them had been divorced, that my mother sent my sister Betty to a boarding school during the time that my mother pretended to be single for 10 years, and that my father had abandoned his daughter uh, when he became divorced. They both got divorced in 1927, or, or maybe he in 28. And he had abandoned, uh, I had another half-sister in the world, uh, someone I never knew existed. Now, I hear all the time now about people who discovered through 23andMe that they have unknown sisters and brothers and uncles and cousins and parents even. But for me at 12, there was no such thing as these revelations that people are having now. I was discovering that my whole life was a lie, that my parents were liars. And uh, for me, I, I don't think I have ever trusted adults since I became a writer, I think, partly because I want always to pull back the layers, pull back the layers, find the truth. I was on shaky ground from that time on. And I think I'm, I'm not sure it's in the book how many, uh, how you, how carefully and kind of um, almost obsessively <laughs> you keep the photo albums, the scrapbooks in our lives, that there's one for every year, an entire shelf of them. And I think as an adult, it struck me, you are going to make sure that the history is accurate. You're going to make sure that the documentation is true. That's really is that, it's is very that, incisive, Abigail. Thank you. <laughs> but am I just being an armchair <laughs> psychologist here? Or do you think they're linked a little bit? The sense of, of things having, pictures not having been reliable and in a way that the- Glory's not being reliable. Yeah. Uh, ex, uh, people close to you who, who love you who aren't reliable. Yeah. And so I guess I'm documenting for you. Yeah. Uh, I have- um, your father and I, as you know, will be married 59 years on December 8th. And I have 59 scrapbooks of, of every year since we met. And I document your lives and our, our, your children's lives, my grandchildren's lives. Some I think things I'd rather not be in those books, but they're there for eternity. Yeah, right. <laughs> Awkward I, childhood pictures. I know, sometimes I think letters. there are little spaces where I think you've taken out pictures of yourself you don't love. <laughs> anyway, that's probably why. Yeah. I mean, when you lose your mother at 15, my mother died when I was 15, and then you lose, you know, well, before she dies, you lose the truth. <laughs> you lose the truth about your own family. And then I lost my room, my house, my belongings. My father sold everything off. He was not a sentimentalist. And so I'm a big sentimentalist. So I'm a saver. So to get to the next generation, Molly, my daughter, uh, took on a project that was unforeseen, entirely driven by her own curiosity. Can you tell us that story and what it led you to? Yeah. Yeah, Molly came to me one day and said, uh, I'm taking a course in biography in college. In college, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, my professor has assigned us to write a biography about a living person. And I'd like to write about you, Grandma. So I am so flattered, of course. Wouldn't everybody be flattered? And she said, but I have to say, he didn't know who you were. <laughs> so... I got very mad, she said, and I showed him, Googled, I, I Googled you for him because, you know, they have to approve your project. Pro professors have to approve your project. And this professor is hearing she wants to write about her grandma. It's like, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> I hate to I hate to besmirch grandmas because I am one, but you can imagine what he thought. And so she proved that I might be actually worth a, a biography. And so Molly, being Molly, being your daughter and my granddaughter. She just took it on and she read all my books and she went to Smith College where I have my archives and she read my articles. And then she came to the house here and where, we're, where I'm sitting right now. And one wall is lined entirely with um, uh, file cabinets and another wall and there's shelves and there's cabinets. And she says, I, you know, she looks at my stuff. She says, oh, I'll go through all this. But where's the childhood stuff? And I point to a cabinet and I say, well, I throw stuff under there that's too big for the scrapbook, you know. And and I don't know, I haven't looked in there in years. And so she she and I both get down on our knees and look inside and she pulls out my teenage diaries, which, you know, those little leather things with a lock and key as if the CIA is going to get into my diaries. And then I see and pushed all the way to the back of a very deep cabinet on the bottom is this hugely packed plastic shopping bag full of letters that are 80 and 85 and 90 years old. And I, I upended on the dining room table and there are letters on, you know, air mail paper and tissue paper and old stamps and documents and certificates and incredible history of my parents' marriage. Um, letters my sister wrote, letters aunts of mine wrote, uh, photos that seem to have been hidden, uh, things that were for a memoirist or a historian, pay dirt. And let me say in today's world, what are they going to unearth? LMK, you know, let me know on, a, on an email. <laughs> so I dove into these letters and I became, I cracked into my own parents' marriage. And the secrets that poured out the things they had hidden way beyond anything that had emerged in from my sister in the past or from anyone else. And I remembered where I got this. I got this when my sister was dying. And remember, she was 14 years older. She died in 2009. I went up to her assisted living residence and we knew it was our last visit. She died of, of ovarian cancer. And we knew it was our last visit because she was taking it on herself to starve herself to death had she died the way she chose to die. And she gave me this bag of letters. And she said, I found this in mommy's closet when she died in 1955. Someday you might want to read these. I took them back from, she was in Brooklyn. I took them back on the train from Boston. I was weeping because I, my sister was dying and I was never going to see her again. So I... I never opened them. I never read them. I just shoved them in, a, in that cabinet and I never saw them till your daughter made me look for my childhood and I pulled them out. And their voices, I mean, you read, the, you excerpt some of them. It's like they're having the conversations today, the yeah. arguments and, uh, and the argue, right. They argue on the page. Yeah. She's weeping on the page, you know. He's boistering on the page, blustering. He is who he is. She is who she was. And the amazing thing is that my mother with the eighth grade education wrote the most literate letters. Yeah, incredible. Unbelievable. Um, I wanted to remind people we're going to go to questions, uh, not now, but soon. So please, please, please put them in the chat and they are going to come to me magically. Um, before we leave the letters, uh, and you, you mentioned this, your mom wrote to Betty, looking back, I realize a strange thing that all my life I led, led a double life. You think that she knew in the end when she was dying that she had, that she was in a sense almost exhausted by the pretense? I think so. And I think, Abigail, I honestly think my feminism is rooted in that, in thinking about her life and being so sad for her that she had to lead a double life that she never felt good enough, that she wasn't made to feel good enough, that she changed. She had to give up all of the jobs that she that excited her and yeah. and kind of was subsumed in she her gave dad. Up one job for her parents to support her parents. She gave up another job because she was marrying my father in 1937 when Jewish men prided themselves on having not women who didn't work outside the home because it was a sign of their masculinity. 
that their wives didn't have to work. So by that time, my mother had worked her way up from a sewing machine operator to a designer at Hattie Carnegie, who's kind of like today's Donna Karen or somebody. And she was off and running, but she had to quit because my father wanted a stay home mom, a stay home woman. Um, it's amazing to have grown up with uh, a mother as I did, who was so fearlessly candid and <laughs> encouraging us also to kind of not blanch, to sort of speak our truth, own our truth. But for someone who spoke openly about having an abortion, you hid the fact that you had a brain tumor. And I want to just go to that chapter for a minute. It's, I think, one of the most powerful in the book, and it's the first. Um, why did was that a secret for you for so long? Why was that something you guarded so carefully? Well, only because you're my daughter do I forgive you for telling that, because that is the first chapter, and I usually don't talk about it. Um, it's very painful, but I had I had a moment when I realized I couldn't write this book unless I outed myself and that it was integral to the whole kind of thesis of the book. And that is that my shame about the brain tumor came years after I divulged my breast cancer in a book. And I was on TV and on the radio talking about my breast cancer and here this brain tumor I couldn't mention ever to anybody except my closest family. As you remember, I convened the entire family at an Indian restaurant and told them, well, I think I'm going to die. I want you all to know how much I love you. <laughs> well, thank God it turned out the brain tumor was benign, um, but I couldn't talk about it and I didn't know why. And then I realized that I was raised to believe that a Jewish girl didn't have to be beautiful as long as she was smart. And that mm -hmm. I lived on my intellect, never on my books. I, and my whole life is about thinking, thinking and writing and speaking and thinking and writing and speaking. And I couldn't lose my mind. Literally, I would lose myself. So I, I was so afraid, even after I found out that it was benign and I was told I was going to be fine and it was taken out. Even then, I felt as soon as someone hears the word brain tumor, they're going to think, I'm, I'm ready. I'm, I'm done. I'm not going to get writing assignments. No one's going to want to hear me speak. I'm, everyone's going to be watching me for the word I forgot, the name I forgot, and uh oh, it's starting, that kind of thing. And I couldn't be myself in the world as a person without a mind because mm -hmm. my whole life had been about that. And so I, I lied. I, I didn't lie. I omitted until I wrote this book and felt that I would be a fake. I would be writing everyone else's secrets and not my own. And just one other question on that. Um, and this is not to name drop, but uh, Alan Ald has been in our lives since I was very young because of Free to Be You and Me and a very long friendship with you and dad and he, he and his wife, Arlene. He was very pivotal in you kind of deciding Yes, he was. Essentially. Oh, and can you just tell us a little bit about what his two advice people, Two people were pivotal, Alan Alda and Blue Greenberg, the founder of the Jewish Orthodox Feminist Alliance, and also a very good friend with her husband, Yitz Greenberg, who, by the way, was the Hillel rabbi at Brandeis and I was his secretary. That's a detour. Um, but with Alan Alda, um, I was writing this book and I was um, shocked when I saw that Alan Alda admitted his Parkinson's on morning TV to the world. And so I called him up and I he, I had not told him about the brain tumor at all or, or Arlene. And I said, Alan, I, I can't believe you did this. Why did you decide to do this? This is amazing. He said, I couldn't carry the secret anymore. It was just too heavy. And I didn't want the gossip columnists to get it before I put it out there the way I want it to be put out there. I didn't want people to, you know, see me trembling because he had Parkinson, has Parkinson. In my next role, let, let me be cast as a person who trembles in my next role, but I didn't want to have to hide it. And I, I had not told him about uh, the brain tumor, and I finally did. I said, well, it's, it's one thing for you to be, to, you know, to be admitting you have Parkinson's. It's a whole different thing for me because I'm Jewish, you know. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I explained to him about Jews and brains and stuff like that. <laughs> Which makes so much sense. <laughs> no sense at all. And he said, well, you know, I played a doctor on TV. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have Parkinson's either or something like that. And he said, let me just say, when you get rid of this secret, you will feel a hundred pounds lighter. And I, he said, I have just been able to move in the world without bur a burden now on me. Mm -hmm. There's nothing I'm ashamed of. There's nothing I'm afraid somebody's going to find out about me. And that plus Blue Greenberg, who, well, you'll read the book and see her, her role in it. Let me okay. do that. I want to incorporate some of the questions that are coming in because they're great. Uh, someone's asking, in today's world, social media seems to encourage oversharing. What's the balance between not keeping secrets and keeping things private? Um, that's for this generation to, to decide, and it's not easy. Um, people say to me, well, the Shonda doesn't really exist anymore, does it? And I say, cancel culture is the Shonda. Mm -hmm. can cancel culture is a, is a reaction that we, would, we used to try to prevent. You know, we, when we said, don't talk, it's a Sha, it's a Shonda. Um, so it's different. What people are ashamed of now has changed. Um, many people are not at the least bit of shame that there's a, a homosexual person in their family. They're completely fine with it. The world has changed in that regard. However, there are still families in which, let's say you're a, a very serious evangelical Christian, it might actually be a Shonda to have the fact that you're a lesbian found out. So Shondas are, are, are still around in different forms for different people. Do you have advice for people about preserving memories and communications in what's now a digital world? Um, I just think it's very important to print, to write long emails. I know that you guys, my children and grandchildren do not write long emails. They're very truncated. I write long emails still, and I print out people who write me long emails, and I file them away like letters. Is this a, a scolding that I'm hearing right now? <laughs> no, it's a, it's a gentle nudge to write longer emails to me whenever we, but what I do with you is I pick up the phone because right. I'm not satisfied right. with, the, with the text. So we have long conversations, and I do with the, your two siblings the same because I don't get long emails. But I have your camp letters and I have your college letters and they're very precious. And every now and then I send them to you. I want you to see your, your former self. It's precious. It's precious. Mm -hmm. And again, maybe it's because I didn't have a mother who kept my history. She was gone when I was 15. You know, my father just didn't care about those things. I had nobody who knew me when I was 17. I had nobody who lived through boyfriends I you know, loved and lost or whatever. I wanted you to have your history, both through my memory and through documentation. Whatever you do with it, you're a writer. Robin's a writer. But just to have it, just to know the former you, the little you, you know, the, the scared you, the proud you. I wanted you all to have that. Someone's asking, was it Molly's research or something else that inspired you to write this book now? So let's explain that, that chronology a little bit. Molly's, Molly came after you were writing the book. Well, but was, what, what made you actually decide to embark on this in the first place? Nice. And a couple people have asked that. Yeah. Well, uh, I started it five years ago um, when I was freaking out about being three years away from 80. I couldn't imagine how, how I got that old so fast. I was young for so long. I got used to it. And I, I was 77 and thinking, you know, I maybe only have one more book in me and it better be a me memoir and I better make sense out of my life before I turn 80. So I was halfway through in this book when Molly uh, did her project, which resulted in enriching this with the voices of the people, not just my parents, but I mean, remember the part about my sister Betty's PS? So... I'll tell you that my father, who I count my father very important in terms of making me take myself seriously as an intellectual. That's the only way he was interested in me, really, frankly. We to talk about a Talmud, you know, a, a, an excerpt, a, a, a case of his or whatever it is, was the way to keep him at his tape at the table. But otherwise, 
otherwise not. Um, now, where was I on this, Abby? You, you were talking about the PS. Oh, oh, the PS, right. Thank you. So my father, to give you a, an idea of him as a person, decided to go to Palestine when my mother was seven months pregnant with me to settle the affairs of his uh, father's estate. He could have gone long before my grandfather died in 1938. I was born in 1939. My mother is seven months pregnant with me. He gets on a boat and he goes to Palestine. And he's gone for six or eight weeks. I don't remember which. So the letters they wrote to each other, this is why there were hundreds of letters because they wrote one a day, each of them, and sometimes two a day. And my sister Betty, would, who was home with my mom, would also often append a little P.S. She was at that point 14 on the end of my mother's letters to my father. And they were in this chopping bed. And I am just, I can't believe it. You know, I find a letter that says, mom is fine and the twins are kicking. The twins. And twins, the twins that my mother, was my mother pregnant with twins? Well, you'll have to read this whole chapter because it becomes a source for me. Of like a, it's like a detective story for me. Mm -hmm. Try to find out if I was one of twins. And then, of course, I had twins, you and Robin. And you famously said to me, you're the one who said to me, maybe God gave you twins to replace the twin you lost. If you I lost. Said that. Wow. You, you did. You're the one. Um, someone's asking uh, about the Holocaust, which you do actually have a very extraordinary piece about. Did the Holocaust present unique challenges in hiding truths for Jews, or do you think any group faced with the impossible would react the same? Um, and they are, are sharing that the, we had a family story about the cousins arriving after the Holocaust. The family never talked about the family lost, as if talking about it would assign guilt to those in the U.S., even though they say they didn't know, and what could they have done? Right. I, I read. I read a very, uh, for what for me was a very emotional chapter to write about that, uh, about how I, I. Uh, it's about my Holocaust ho nightmare, which I have every few years. It's the same nightmare. Uh, I'm not going to describe it because it's horrible. But um, I was born here. Um, um, I know people who are Holocaust survivors, and I know they never wanted to talk about it. And I also know that people who didn't live through the Holocaust, who were here, have a, an, a, an incohate shame on behalf of the Jewish people that we went from like, like sheep to the slaughter. And that makes me furious and riles me up. Because in my nightmare, I see how impossible resistance was. And I say, what would I have done? I have three little, you three little kids with me. And there was no way I could resist none or anyone with, you know, SS guns pointed at you with bombs everywhere, with roundups and all of that. It's insane for anyone to say. And yet a, a survivors feel that we feel that that we, why didn't you resist? Why would, I would have fought back. A lot of Israelis are very, you know, militant about, it. we would have fought back. Oh yeah? Hmm. So uh, I write about that. I write about the complications that we all feel about, you know, not wanting people to have to relive the past if it's so agonizing. And it obviously is for many reasons, because some people are ashamed of what they were forced to do, even though, they were forced to do it, but they can't own it. They can't uh, implicate themselves in, in the truth of that. And so uh, that's a generation whose secrets are so unique. It's almost a violation to try to parse them. I remember learning um, at, at Yad Vashem and how they reimagined the museum, the Memorial Museum, to make it less about the victimization and or or weighted towards victimization and more about resistance. Right. Um, it seems most, someone is asking, it seems most parents lie to their children right from the start. <laughs> but why does it seem that Jewish parents are bigger liars than the general population? <laughs> it's a little bit of a generalization, but we can get us in trouble. But there's a thing. I already generalized that I think Jew Jewish uh, shame is Jewish because I grew up feeling it. it. I knew what I had to hide and I found out things I didn't know and 
The secrets were everywhere. I was steeped in secrets. So I and, thought, and what this and what this that questioner is asking is true. It's it's unbelievable once you scratch the surface in your family alone, how many people lied about yeah, things. About things they needed to for for their mm -hmm. own for their own needs. I mean, about money, about mental illness, about the C word. I was never told my 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 mother was dying until it was too late for me to be able to communicate with her because she, she was on on morphine. I was cheated of those last conversations for my own good because it would have been too hard. I was a junior in, in high school. How could I get through my exams if I knew my mother was dying? Well, you know, she died right in the middle of my junior second semester of my junior year. So, I mean, we're not unique. And of course, many cultures have secrets of all, all kinds, including, for example, I was reading in the Times the other day about a Chinese poet who, who found out about the role of her parents in the Cultural Revolution, where Mao required intellectuals to work in the fields and, you know, where people had to hide turn, the fact that they turned in their neighbors. They have plenty big secrets, Chinese and Chinese Americans have, have uh, been the uh, heirs to those secrets, and it's very hard for them. Um, uh, African Americans have had to deal with, with you know, were they did they have um, relatives who were passing? Passing is a tremendous issue in the in the African American community because everybody who could pass is like saying, my my grandmother or my aunt or my great grandmother was raped by a white slave owner. And these become very dense, thick secrets that you have to work to find the glory and the honor in those experiences rather than the shame. And every culture has some of that. But so we have, Sorry, go ahead. Do you want to finish? Sentence? No, I'm just saying every culture has it, but these are ours. I'm reading about what ours. ours. What are the moral and legal questions in memoir writing about other persons, especially identifiable known ones? And this questioner is sharing, I'm writing a semi-autobiographical semi screenplay and graphic memoir. It mildly tarnishes my deceased respected physician father as he had a bad attitude with me. My sister says I shouldn't air, quote, air the family laundry. Do I remain silent? That's from Diane. Diane, your life is your story. I mean, someone doesn't can't take your life away from you or censor it. You lived it. Your experience with your father is part of who you are, and maybe the pain of it needs to be written on the page and to get rid of it for you. Uh, you can't libel a dead person, so that's first the first thing legally. You can't libel a dead person. I asked the children of the dead people I write about because there was nobody left in my parents' generation, so I asked my cousins. I'm going to tell the story about this. I'm going to tell the story about that. Is, is, does that hurt you? Is that okay with you? I have a whole chapter on my cousin Sima, who you know, who's one of my favorite cousins. who's a real bohemian and a, a terrific woman. And uh, I asked her, how did you rate your childhood? She gave it a 10. I couldn't believe it because I knew that the whole family had lied to her and never told her that her birth mother died giving birth to her. And the woman she thought was her mother was not her birth mother. And she still gave her childhood a 10 because she said, I felt loved, you know? Mm -hmm. And it, but she said, it's fine, write about it, write about it. And we have a colloquy in that chapter about our very different feelings. I resent my family for lying to her. She's fine with it. <laughs> well, she ended up living with us for two years. My mother took her in because after her mother died, it took her, her father two years to find a new wife. And my mother raised her for two years in our house. Um, so uh, I loved her. She was like a baby doll for me. And then when she started really getting very close to my parents, I was glad that my her father took her back. <laughs> How might 20th century feminism have enabled your disclosures in yours and other Jewish women's lives? Thank you for that question, because uh, feminism is all about telling the truth about your life and being able to own who you are without apology. Not having to fake that you don't know something so that the boy that you're with on a date won't be offended because he doesn't know the directions to the movie theater. 
So you know the direction, but you don't tell them because you're supposed to hide what you know. We shouldn't have to hide what we know. We shouldn't have to hide who we are or who we've been. All the women who hid their abortions, illegal and legal. It troubles me that through the 50 years of Roe being legal, we never managed to slough off the stigma to the mm. point where women would speak honestly. They still felt there was something wrong about they're having had abortion care that then allowed them to make responsible parental decisions later. They didn't, um, they didn't feel they, they wanted to make common cause with others who'd had the same. There was a little bit of shame still attached to it. So feminism is saying, get rid of it all. Get, get it rid of it all. It's, all. it's a barrier to becoming who you, who you are and who you're meant to be. Um, we haven't really talked about where I appear in this book. <laughs> <laughs> Examples of when I caused you shame or, um, but, but let's just touch on one in our, in our last uh, 10 minutes, which is the, the fact that I was dating someone who, uh, I don't know if it was more alarming to you that I might not carry on the Jewish uh, line or that he was a neoconservative. <laughs> um, Dad was but a I didn't bad know. Dad was upset that I had raised the other issue because then he didn't have any purchase on the first, on the second on issue. the first issue, right. right. He, he also didn't like that he only ate uh, iceberg lettuce. He said, how can someone not want lettuce with any nutrients in it? Um, <laughs> but and, that he, more, and that he ate standing up. Okay, and mom, mom, people. this is a long time ago. <laughs> but the point is, I'm sure that many, I didn't end up with this person. Um, and I want to be careful because there are so many who do have interfaith lives and marriages and families that are beautiful and successful and meaningful and often um, very much uplifting Jewish tradition and continuity. But it was, you really were, I think I described it in my book, like you became like Tevya, <laughs> rending, your, rending your garments, and that it was sort of a moment of, of panic and almost a sense of failure for you. Can you just talk about that? I know you write about it in the book, but give us a, a little bit of a sense of it. I didn't know that I was going to react that way, Abby. I, I was shocked at myself, frankly, because I, I, I'm a, a liberal, a hard-carrying liberal, and, I, and nothing human is alien to me. And I worked on interfaith and inter-ethnic dialogue for my whole life. And it just became a, it was... In my kishkas, it became gut level. And, and I just thought, our our family has lived through so much. I mean, we left, my grandparents on both sides left because of the Cossacks. And, and if they had stayed, they would have been gotten by the Nazis. And that, I internalized that history. It became me, my history, and I didn't even realize it because I was born here, you know, an American in Jamaica. I lived in Jamaica, New York. But I somehow became a survivor in the sense that I had to protect the line. And I couldn't believe that you would, any of my children would go off and, and he, he happened to be a Roman Catholic and a believer and that you might have Catholic children and break the link in the chain just killed me. And I was unprepared. I didn't, I didn't handle it well, as you and I well know. And they can read the book and find out the terrible things I did and said and what happened. But, um, and you on your own um, left that relationship. And I, before you left that relationship, I flew out to where you were living. And because you had left, you couldn't be with, be near me. I was really toxic. And um, I flew out there and I said, I am going to learn to love him and your children no matter what, because they'll be yours, they'll be your family. I had worked myself to that real commitment. And several months later, you reached your own decision. I don't know what I, whether I could have been good at it or could have done it well, given my own Michigas in the, on the issue. But I, I had tried really hard and I thought I was ready to do whatever. And I would have, even if it wasn't an interfaith marriage or an interfaith upbringing, even if you went to, to, into Catholicism on his behalf. I just was ready for whatever came because I refused to lose you. Yeah. Well, thank you for having the courage to tackle it. I was never going to raise Catholic children, but we can talk about that another time. 
Well, um, <laughs> I didn't know. What, but someone is asking, what do you hope people get out of reading your book? I hope that they will get, get out of it a desire to lead a secret free life because I have tried to do so and it's very freeing. The last thing I had was the, uh, the brain tumor, which was benign. <laughs> um, <laughs> poo, poo, poo. Right. We never even got to my mother's superstitions. Um, and a secret free life gives you, you know, nothing to protect against, nothing to hide, nothing to worry that people will find you out, you know. It's just a, a better way to live if you can. Before we get to the last question, I want to just answer a couple of quick ones that are wonderful, but but I think easily kind of dispensed with. Um, Sherry is, I think that's her name. Yes, yeah, Sherry wanted to remember that, that Bert, my dad, um, fixed her up on a blind date for the annual Rutgers boat ride in 1954, and that he was popular. Woo! Go, Dad, and um, and that he played the banks are made of marble. Um, that is a wonderful uh, song that I grew up with. Um, and uh, please ask Bert if he remembers that time. So I did ask him if he remembers that time. He remembers the song, but not that exactly. Right, right, right. But we're going to forgive that. Someone wants to know where in Jamaica you lived, Mom. Can you just dash that yeah, off? I lived on a, at eighty two twenty one hundred sixty seventh Street, and then at eighty five thirty six Wareham Road in Jamaica States. I see that that somebody asked why my archives are at Smith instead of at Brandeis where I went, and it's because I asked Brandeis if they wanted it and never got my archives and never got an answer. Those were the days when Brandeis wasn't terribly well organized. Smith was after me constantly, so I gave it to them. That's why. And um, someone's asking if you ever met your half-sister, Rena. So can you explain? I did, and that's one of the chapters in the book that makes me the saddest. I did meet Rena. We had a relationship for several years and it was ill-fated. And you can't blame her. She was abandoned by my father, our father, and it was a very complicated reunion. Um, were your parents born in the U.S.? When did they emigrate? And did your family lose anyone in the Holocaust? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, one third of their family was lost in the Holocaust, the ones who stayed. My sister Betty once did a family reunion and put on oak tag all around the room of the, the little motel ballroom we were in, um, a family tree, and you could see dead ended all the ones who didn't leave for Israel or, or here. Mm. They died. Anyway, my, my mother was born in Pilipitz in, in Hungary, a little shtetl in Hungary, and came here when she was either eight, nine, seven, eight, or nine, she lied among other things about her age. So I'm not sure exactly how old she was when he, when she came. My father was born here and always lorded it over her, called her Greenhorn. But he was he made it only because his mother was pregnant on the boat and didn't deliver till she got here. So he was born here. He was a real American and she was a Greenhorn. Someone's asking what's next for you. What are you working on now? I'm trying not to work on anything else because that was five years, five really, really hard, hard work, hard five years. But uh, if I, I should live so long, as they say in my family, if I should live so long, um, I might have a, a character in, in, in mind who could maybe become a novel. Really, this is news to me. I know, I know. I was thinking about it just the other day. Yeah. Um, you write, my husband jokes that I'm so sentimental, I get nostalgic about the present. How much, I guess I want to end with just, what I have grown up with is how you savor, you savor the moments, you savor celebrations, you want us to really be in it. How much is that, do you think, connected to secrecy, to Shonda? to what your inheritance is to secrecy to shanda to loss to wanting things to be frozen for the moment that you're in it instead of letting it just whiz by and uh, as you know i have what i call shehechianu moments the shehechianu is a blessing over time it stops time and it asks us to 
be grateful for the fact that we lived long enough to witness this moment. It can't be a better blessing for living mindfully. And so I, I've done that. I try to make everything as memorable and as um, celebrated as, as fate allows us to have. And you never know how long you'll have it. So I want to cherish it. And I believe in, I believe in anticipating and then living in the moment and then reliving after it and to get the pleasure of the memory. Well, I cherish you. I love you to bits. Thank you for doing this. Thanks to Moment Magazine. I'm passing it over to Suzanne, who's been a wonderful host. And thank you all for being with us and definitely read this book. And it's a perfect Hanukkah gift. Get it for everyone you love. It will relate to these stories, even if they are not their own. Um, it's just, it's a wonderful read. Back to you, Suzanne. Yes, thank you both uh, for this wonderful, wonderful conversation. And Letty, thank you for sharing your secrets with us. Uh, again, the name of the book is Shonda, A Memoir of Shame and Secrecy. I've put a link to the in the chat to this. We'll also be sending out a follow-up email that will include a link to the recording along with a link to the book as well. Uh, we'll also include the links to Abigail's books that I mentioned at the beginning of the session. I want to remind everybody to go to momentmag.com where you can register for next Next week's Zoominar about is there a, such a thing as bad Jews tomorrow on Facebook Live, a conversation with screenwriter Max Talisman. And please be sure to check out our gala that is coming up on November 20th. Again, Letty, Abigail, thank you again. And we look forward to seeing everybody next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.